Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. May I call the meeting to order? And may I just uh, begin with two public service announcements before I move on to the business of the day. Uh, the first is that um, because of new, various new rules about um, communications and privacy, I have to say that when you come to one of these meetings from now on, which we videotape, your presence here is a kind of acceptance that if you ask a question, well, your presence here is an acceptance that uh, you might actually be filmed and shown on a videotape of the meeting. Um, we're not, um, this is not, of course, kind of deliberate on our part. We're not singling people out unless they ask a question when they single themselves out. But it's simply a rule that, um, uh, because unless we, we give you uh, that assurance, um, we're not able always to film the whole thing at all, which means that we reduce the size of our audience. So. Thank you for coming, and thank you for giving that implicit consent to uh, being filmed. Um, secondly, I'd like to welcome you all on a warm day uh, to a room which we are trying to keep cool, but um, it's a tribute to your public spirit that you should um, have decided to come out of the sun and into a, um, a not completely cool room um, for a, an intellectual event of the kind which uh, I'm very much myself looking forward to. Um, in the Danube Institute, we've been able over the last four years to bring some distinguished um, foreign guests to speak to Hungarians. And we've had several meetings in other countries, one in London, one in Washington, and one in, and several in Australia, um, which um, brought distinguished Hungarians to audiences in those countries, I think to the benefit of, of all in every case. And, uh, but on this occasion, we have a distinguished Hungarian returning from a, dis a distinguished academic career in England to address an audience of Hungarians. He may say one or two things are Hungarian, but because a lot of people who don't speak Hungarian also come to these meetings, uh, I, uh, I, I think that, um, uh, that he will generally speak to us in English. Now, um, the, the topic is an extremely um, interesting one because it blends both politics and something which is political, but which is not readily seen to be so, namely um, the upbringing of children by parents. In an ideal world, I would hope that wouldn't be political, but all my life it's been the subject of discussions in Parliament and in discussions in the media as to what is, what is the correct way to bring up children and how should we, um, uh, and, and what rules do we need to, to introduce to make sure that children are not brought up badly. Um, uh, I would say, from the standpoint which may or may not be supported by the, our distinguished speaker today, that I have noticed over the years that the common sense uh, tales of how to bring up children, which um, mothers pass on to their daughters, who pass them on to their granddaughters, um, are often somewhat more reliable than the apparently ever-changing advice of the experts in this area. Now I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking, uh, I'm introducing someone who is not exactly an expert in this area, but, but a sociologist of wide range who has applied a critical intelligence to a lot of issues um, and who in addition to having um, written, I think, um, books in several languages and appeared in the mass media and uh, intellectual magazines of um, at least uh, three countries, he um, uh, he has um, also um, developed um, a, 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 a website with his colleagues called Spiked, which is one of the strongest and most effective websites on politics and on international affairs and on broader um, intellectual affairs and academic life um, in, in Great Britain. And therefore, because of course the internet doesn't really respect national boundaries, it's one of the most important websites now to be found in the politics of the West as a whole. I'm sure there are people in Hungary who, who, who um, follow it. Um, Frank Ferreira is, as I mentioned already, really Hungarian. He's lived most of his life in England. He's a sociologist, but also a political activist. Um, and he is dealing with a subject which, as I say, um, would once have been thought not directly political, but when we have large numbers of young people at universities um, attempting to restrict free speech rather than, as 
we might once have thought attempting to uh, expect it, uh, attempting to um, extend it, then we are obviously living in a slightly different and, and very curiously different um, intellectual climate. Um, how has this climate of um, intellectual change come about? Um, what do we think of it? And if we don't like all aspects of it, what would we propose in order to restore a more balanced environment for people to hold political and other intellectual discussions? So I can't think of anyone better to uh, address this than Frank Ferredi. And Frank, um, the floor is yours. Jó estét, sajnos nem fog magyarul beszélni. Annak ellenére, hogy ez egy nagyon fontos téma, és szerintem nagyon sajnálom, hogy ezt a témát nem beszélnek, erről nem beszélnek túl sokat Magyarországon. Nincsenek viták erről, hogy, hogy mit csinálunk a fiatalokkal, a gyerekekkel. És szerintem ez a legfontosabb téma azért, mert ez az országnak, meg egész Európának a jövőjéről szól. Úgyhogy én elhatároztam, hogy a következő négy-öt évben Főleg erről fogok dolgozni, és erről fogok írni, mert ha ezt a problémát nem, nem, nem tudunk csinálni vele, akkor szerintem egy nagy tragédia lesz a jövőben. Anyway, back into English. Uh, I've been doing a lot of research recently on the problem of socialization, the problems associated with bringing up young kids, uh, and uh, in particular what I'm really interested in is answering the question, why is it that the current generations of, of young people between the ages of 12 to 22 appear to be relatively fragile, appear to lack an aspiration for independence, uh, find it very difficult to deal with intellectual challenges in schools and universities, um, and in particular have become estranged from many of the values uh, with which uh, Western society grew up over the last two, three hundred years. Now my work began a, at the turn of the century. I wrote a book called Paranoid Parenting, which looked at the problem of child rearing, and in particular looked at what I felt was a major issue, something that I've been <coughs> preoccupied with, which is what I call the loss of parental authority and the loss of adult authority, where in general, increasingly it's seen that a parent a mother and a father lacks the intellectual and moral resources to know how to bring up children. And because mothers and fathers are, are so stupid and are so badly educated, what you need are these experts to come in, psychologists, therapists, there's a whole army of experts. In fact, in England, there are more parenting experts than rats who kind of come in and show the way. Uh, and there's an, a term we use in the English language which captures this, which is called parenting skill. I don't know if there's a Hungarian word for it yet. Parenting skill. Now, parenting means very many things, but the idea of having a skill, you know, there's a distinct skill of parenting is weird. Because, call me old fashioned, but where I come from, child rearing and parenting is a relationship. It's an interactive relationship between a number of intimate peoples, mothers and fathers and children. And my argument has been that in general parents, using their intuition, learning from their family and their community and their friends, are far more likely to do the right thing with their children than if they read any one of these hundreds of child reading books, which give you a different advice every single year. And I remember, when I wrote my book on paranoid parenting, when I began the book, the advice was in England that you, that you as a mother and as a father have a duty and a responsibility to sleep with your child. If you don't sleep with your child, you're not going to bond, you're not going to come close to each other, and therefore your child will have all kinds of emotional and psychological difficulties. By the time I finished the book, and I write very fast, it only took me nine months to finish the book. By the time I finished the book, the advice was, it's wrong to sleep with your child. It's the worst thing you could possibly do. And they were giving you statistics about the number of children that died of cod deaths and other things because they were sleeping with their moms. And I have collected this conflicting advice. I've got a collection. 
a long collection of how the advice changes and is diametrically opposite to what it was six, seven months ago. And nevertheless, despite all this, people still call themselves parenting experts. I mean, the funniest thing is, of course, is that most parenting experts wouldn't know what a child looked like if they bumped into it. <laughs> Many of them don't have children themselves. I remember uh, the very first debate I did on paranoid parenting, I went up to Glasgow in Scotland. And uh, I was said, look, Frank, you know, we come, you're coming up here. We want you to debate the question of expertise with one of our parenting experts. So I go on into the table. I look at the parenting expert. The parenting expert turned out to be a nun. <laughs> now, you know, nuns are nice. They're, they're very pleasant people. You know, they're very spiritual. But they never had firsthand hands-on experience with bringing up a child. And afterwards, I said to her, and she was a, a little bit offended, I said, look, if I want to fix my car, right, if I want to really fix my, my automobile, I'm not going to go to somebody that doesn't, doesn't drive a car, that doesn't know how to change gears or, or, or know what speed is like. And similarly, if I want to know about how to bring up children, I'm not going to go to somebody who's never experienced the pain of staying up the whole night while your child was, was crying, having to do with the emotional issues and fighting those little battles that you do with your kid on a daily basis. So this is really what got me started on this. And since then, I've, become, I've written a, lot of, a couple of other books about the way that this problem of um, using a technocratic instrumental approach towards child rearing really has a horrible impact on teenagers and, and people going into universities. And the first time I noticed this was, was, uh, was because I do this uh, test every single year with my first year sociology student. And I've been doing it for 35, 40 years. And what I do the very first uh, lecture that I give at the university is I look at my young students and I say, how many of you think of yourselves as men and women, young men and young women, or as boys and girls? Now, when I first started teaching, Everybody said, I'm a young man or I'm a young woman. I mean, there was a few sad people in the corner <laughs> you know, would say that I'm a, I'm a child, I'm a girl and a boy. But you know, by the time you're 18, 19, 20, it's very weird for you to think like that. In the last 15 years, when I asked my students the same question, they all put up their hands and say, boy and girl. You know, they think of themselves as, as children, as biologically mature children rather than as adults, young adults, in the way that it would have been the case in the past. And I've done this in America, in Australia, in Canada, all the Anglo-American world. In fact, in, in North America, it's worse. I mean, North American 21-year-olds, you know, reminded me of what my son was like when he was 12 or 13 in terms of their behavior. So it's even worse over there. And so, the question that we have to answer, you know, you know, why is this? And there are many, many answers. The, the main answer as you get, which I think is completely wrong, is that for some mysterious reasons, children today, young people today, are more disposed towards mental health problems. That we live in a technologically rich environment. <coughs> that we have the social media. That is all these problems that have kicked in. And because of all these changes in the world, children have become much more you know, prone to have depression, to have stress, to have autism, and there's a variety of psychological ailments which proliferate. And when I say proliferate, they are changing all the time. You get a situation now where in Southern California, one out of every three boys are on Ritalin because they're active, hyperactive. Now, what, what is hyperactivity? Well, I was hyperactivity. You know, when you're seven or eight, you're bored in school. I mean, I don't know if you remember what it was like. You were bore, bored out of your mind. And we used to run around and get into fights and get into trouble. And that was, in those days, we called it being a boy. Now you get a medical diagnosis. And you get a riddle and shoved down your throat. And I think that kind of pattern, uh, you know, of seeing children as being... Uh, somehow more fragile, more vulnerable, and we use the word vulnerability, is the main explanation. My explanation is fundamentally different. 
I think the reason why young people are in the situation they're in today has got to do with the way we go about socializing them, bringing them up. The kind of values we don't teach them and the values that we do teach them. I think in many respects, one of the biggest problems that we have, uh, and it's something that those of you who are conservative should worry about. I'm not a conservative myself, I'm old fashioned liberal, but I do share the conservative concern with children. There's one thing that we should all be concerned about is the disdain and the hostility that young people are taught towards the past. Young people are told that there aren't any good old days, that there are simply bad old days. Young people are told that when you're looking at the 19th century in England, this is the Victorian era. And the Victorian era is by definition horrible, child labor, slavery, women's oppression, gay people didn't get a, the, the clubs they needed, you know, sort of trans people weren't even discussed in the 19th century, and it's all the fault of Queen Victoria. There's a kind of anachronistic view of the way that the past is kind of represented. And I think that as a result of that, what has happened is that education, both formal education and informal education, has become totally detached from the past. We don't teach people history, and in particular, we don't acquaint young people with the rich experience of struggle and of traditions, of philosophizing, the theological gains and insights of previous generations. We don't teach young kids those things. Instead, we have this obsession with novelty. For example, in Europe, if you, I don't know if you know any teachers here, but there's a thing called PISA. And what PISA is, is this very stupid comparison of different countries. And the PISA education program that the European Union has is all based on what's called the skills curriculum, rather than teaching content, intellectual and academic content. And the basic premise of the skills curriculum, which unfortunately even Hungary is, seems to be uh, sort of buying into, and I do need to talk to the Minister of Education about this, what the skills uh, curriculum argues, and this is, the, this is the statement they always make, is that because we live in a rapidly changing world, the world has never changed as fast as we, have you ever heard that? Every education document begins with that sentence. The world is changing at an ever, ever rapid you know, sort of pace. And because we live in a rapidly changing world, the argument goes that the experience of the past, the insights of the past, the facts of the past, are no longer relevant. The, kids that, the things that kids will learn today will be outdated by the time they finish school. That's the conventional wisdom. I think it's wrong because I think the rich traditions and the rich legacies of, the, of European civilization aren't outdated. You know, geometry is drama, Euclidean geometry is Euclidean geometry, even in the 21st century. The times table, as far as I know, has not changed fundamentally in the 21st century. Almost everything to do with philosophical ideals, virtues, moral insights, are, have relevance today as much as it had in the past. Maybe we can reappropriate them and present them in a new kind of a way. So what we have is a situation where we become distanced from the past. And my argument is that, is that you cannot socialize young people unless you give them a root, a sense of belonging within the confines of the past. This is the point that at one time everybody understood from the left to the right. Aaron, Hannah Arendt, in her very important book, article, what is education makes the point that all education is based on conserving the past. That was the basic premise of that. And everybody, for even someone like Antonio Gramsci, the Italian Marxist, used to argue against Mussolini about the importance of learning Latin and Greek and the importance of classical education, that that was the foundation on which Europe can go forward. And someone like the English conservative philosopher Michael Oakeshott also said the same thing, that in, in a sense, the need to conserve the legacy of the past was essential if young people were going to uh, sort of move forward. Now, one of the things that I began to look at is to, is to ask the question and try to find an answer as to why we've become so scared <coughs> or at least so estranged from the past. And the conclusion that I come up with is very simple and straightforward. 
it's got to do with the fact that the cultural elites of European society and the establishment, even the mainstream establishment of European society, have become embarrassed about their way of life. They didn't simply become embarrassed about their way of life. You notice when you talk to people in France or in Holland or in England who have almost like elite backgrounds that they almost have a kind of self-loathing for the ideals that their parents and their grandparents and their ancestors have stood up for. There seems to be a kind of a visceral reaction. And because they themselves are not sure about where they stand in relation to the past, and they're also not sure what are the values that we should live by, they really don't feel very comfortable about socializing young people. As it happens, this began, the first moment when you could really see it happening, the early embryonic stages of this was just after First World War when what's called progressive education kicked in. And what progressive educators argued is that look at us, we had this horrible First World War, we were killing each other, we really messed up. How dare, how dare we be so arrogant as to teach our children what we believed in when we ourselves know that it led to the Great War? And if you look at progressive educators, what they were essentially arguing is something very important, which is that I, as a teacher, do not have an authority to really socialize people into the values that I grew up with. And people in politics, in cultural life, and also parents became less and less interested in communicating the values that were taken for granted for the previous 200 years. And, and this was something that wasn't simply confined to a small section of society. By the time you get to the 1970s, even conservative educators were arguing, in some cases, for what's called child-centered education. Child-centered education me, meaning that somehow the initiative for what you learn comes not, not from the world of adults, not from the teachers, but it comes from the child itself. And by the time you get to the time I was writing my book, I was astonished to realize that the teaching profession in England had ceased to use the word education. I think it's quite telling. Education was too strong for them. They used the word learning. Now you might think that learning and education are the same thing, but education involves discipline, it involves the learning of an academic subject, it involves learning what you don't know, right? Learning we do all the time. You know, when I bump into John, I learn, you know, that uh, I should move in a different kind of a way. Learning doesn't mean very much other than absorbing the experience of everyday life. You don't have to go to school for, to learn. And what's really weird, and I experienced this when I did a debate in an English uh, school, an English, uh, like a gymnasium here, is that the principal of the school referred to himself not as headmaster, I'm not a headmaster, Frank. I thought, I said, I thought you were. That's what we used to call you in my days, I said. He said, no, no, I'm the head learner. <laughs> right? he, at first, I thought he was taking the piss. I, I thought he was not really serious. But then I realized that they were all using that kind of a language. And when you call yourself head, a head learner, the implication is that we're all learners. And it sounds very democratic. Oh, yeah, we're all just learning. You know, I just happen to be 86 and you're 12, you know, but you know, we're all learning in this room. But what you're actually doing by being so cool and democratic is abandoning your responsibility for educating young people. And that's what it really, you basically forget about your duties as a teacher and you basically adopt this kind of uh, sort of take it or leave it uh, kind of attitude. So I, it seems to me that that loss of adult authority became uh, a very much uh, sort of the case, very much prevalent in those days. So the question becomes, what do you do when you refuse or find it very difficult to socialize people in values, in moral values, right? about what is right and wrong, about how to lead your life? What do you do? Well, the answer that the Americans came up with, and whatever the answer that the Americans come up with, becomes, is echoed in, a, in Britain you know, a year later and then comes to Western Europe, 
The answer the Americans came up with is that the way you socialize young people is by validating them. Validating them. What validating means, the word that I hate, you know, I remember the first time I heard, I was, I was giving my, one of my platonic seminars. My platonic seminars are based on the idea that I ask questions and questions and questions and I put students under pressure. And just when they gave me the answer, they think I, they've answered it, I said, well, why are you saying that? So they're forced to account for themselves. And this American student had just come over and said to me, sir, instead of putting pressure on me, why don't you validate me? That was the, that was the, and I, I, that was the first time I heard it. And I thought that was very strange because I never imagined that my role was to validate anybody, never mind a complete stranger. Even my wife, I don't validate. You know, and my son, I don't, never mind someone that's completely a stranger to me. And then, of course, you realize that what the Americans meant by it was that by validating is you affirm people. It means that when you're a teacher, you don't criticize the students. It means you don't use a red pen when you correct their essays. It means, for example, uh, sort of little things like that, that you are concerned about your, their self-esteem. It means that when the children uh, just do basic average work, you call them, that's really brilliant, John, that's excellent, you know, sort of instead of saying, well, you could do a little bit better, couldn't you, you know, if you put your back to it. It means that when a child comes, and my son used to come home from school, I remember this, it used to be a joke in the family, he would come home from school, not with one, but with 15 smiley faces from the teachers. The, the teachers were just giving out smiley faces. Do you give out smiley faces in Hungary? I don't know. I would imagine it. It's a horrible, unnecessary habit. Anyways, you know, and, and, and if you go to see a teacher and talk to them about your child, the teacher was, oh yeah, your son Jacob, he's, he's very smart. He's, he, and he's, she said, he works very, very hard. And of course, the mother and I knew that he never lifted a finger. We knew that he didn't work very hard. We also knew that he wasn't a genius, you know, sort of, but anyway, but nevertheless, that's what teachers have to do. You validate this. So what happens? When children go through this process of being validated, by the time they get to university, right, where you're meant to be criticized, when you ask questions, when you put pressure on people, they think that you've committed a cultural crime. I mean, how dare you do this? How dare you put us under pressure? How I remember, again, an American, I'm not anti-American, I love American people, you know, sort of, especially certain kinds of American people. But, but I, I, I do remember, uh, this was in, in 19, no, sorry, it was in 202. I got a habit that when I teach students, I, 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 I tell them, all right, kids, I just read this book last night. Why don't you go away and read it and come back next week, see what you think. You know, I think that's a, a normal thing to do as a university teacher. <laughs> This American kid, and he was a kid, puts up his hand and says, Sir, do you expect us to read a whole book? <laughs> that was the question. Do you expect us to read a whole book? And I, and I thought he was joking with me. You know, what, and I said, well, you, you, do you just want to read the front title page and that's it or whatever? And he was deadly serious. As far as he was concerned, it, it, was, it, it was beyond the pale that he should be asked to read 280 pages. Right. I think he basically said, should I read the introduction, the conclusion, the index, you know, you know or whatever. And I, that kind of really showed me as to how we've taken off the idea of putting pressure on young people, that we kind of force them to and encourage them and challenge them and stretch them to do their best. Because increasingly that, that kind of goes against the, the culture that they've been uh, socialized into. How much time have I got left? I just out of curiosity. Well, I think we're doing fine. Yeah, all right. Well, well, give me like two minutes, you know, sort of to, all right. I meant two minutes before I should wrap up. Anyway, so um, I wrote an article about this in the, in the Sunday Times. Uh, and, uh, and I said this is, you know, and, and I kind of, to me this was, I was horrified by the idea that you could no longer expect university students to read a whole book. And also by that time I knew that there were many students in England who got a degree, a, a BA degree, without ever having read a whole book. You know, they would have read handouts and chapters and you know, little things like that. And so, I get a, after all this article in the Sunday Times, I get a letter from my vice chancellor, that's like the principal of the university. And he writes me this article, Frank, I was very surprised by your article. You know, and, uh, and I thought he was gonna tell me, you made the story up, it's not really true. I thought that's what he was gonna say. But instead of what he said, 
I'm really surprised by, by what, what you said in the Sunday Times, uh, because why is it that you privilege the book? Well, that was the, <laughs> the exact word I used. Why do you privilege the book when, in fact, there are other ways of teaching young people? You know, we are very modern, technical ways of teaching, you know, using PowerPoints creatively, you know, using this gadget and that gadget. And I, and I just thought, my God, this is what British higher education is moving towards. Uh, you know, sort of, isn't that, isn't that a problem? Because what we're doing is, is we're basically using psychological techniques. Now, my argument basically is, is that when you begin to use psychological techniques to socialize young people, you make young people extremely uh, conscious of mental health issues. They become easily disposed to mental health problems. They will regard themselves as weak and fragile. And therefore, their whole aspiration to growing up and, and gaining maturity becomes fundamentally kind of compromised. And to that extent, I think what Western society has done is it undermined uh, sort of uh, the way that young people grow up and develop. So what is, it, what, you know, what is the challenge that we face? Now, if I was giving another lecture, I would spend about two hours talking about the challenge we face. But basically, it's reducible to challenging the values that dominate socialization. And they're not values in the sense that you and I might think about. They're not moral values. To challenge the kind of technical, <coughs> political, social engineering values that are used to socialize young people by the values that I think will really work to make us strong again. You see, the values that you learn in an Anglo-American university or school or any kind of setting is first of all, the number one value is self-esteem. The most important thing in the world is how you feel about yourself. You know, well, obviously, we like, all like to feel good, but that is not a value. That is simply an appeal to be self-obsessed and to be concerned about yourself. The second dominant value, particularly in the United States, is, a, is one that I hate the most, is the value of non-judgmentalism. The idea that we cannot judge each other. You know, the judging each other is somehow wrong. Whereas where I come from, judgment, or what Aristotle called phronesis, is the foundation for a public life. By judging each other, we take each other seriously. And more, most importantly, we learn to discriminate, and we learn to, to, to argue and to, and to debate and learn from each other. As Hannah Arendt said, without judgment, there cannot be a public world that we're born into. The third value that they really are into is diversity. I don't know if you heard of diversity. I'm up to here with this. Yes. Uh, diversity means many, many things. But ab above all, it basically means that you take a very relative, relativistic orientation towards the world. That the more heterogeneous things are, the better. The less homogeneous we are, the better. So it, it, that what diversity is really about is an appeal not to take anything too seriously, not to uh, judge anything as being more important than others. So that no culture is better than any other culture. No religion is better than any, real, any other religion and all the rest of that. The fourth value that we got to challenge is their risk aversion, that young people shouldn't take risks, which to me is the very opposite of courage. The word courage has become a dirty word in the Anglo-American world. You know, I grew up on courage, but these days courage is regarded as very masculine. You know, it's very male. And some people, you know, sort of have gone so far as to say, well, okay, you know, I don't mind courage as long as we redefine it. So in many places, courage means anything. You know, if you tie your shoelaces, you're being courageous. You know, there's all, if you go to self-help bookshops in America, they have all these books called Courage to Heal, Courage to Survive, Courage to Get Up in the Morning. I mean, basically, <laughs> it, it's rendered into a kind of banal kind of concept. So it's risk aversion and, to, and finally, safety. That how, somehow your security uh, is more important than freedom. I think all these debates on campuses on free speech have a, as their premise the idea that people's security not being offended their emotional state is more important than freedom. And safety has become probably the most sacralized concept insofar as there's any sacralization in the Western world. And I think these are the values that we need to challenge and have a crusade against and, and argue because they really are destroying 
the whole foundation of Western society. Now, what are the values that we need to socialize them in order to overcome the prevailing moral uh, sort of confusion? Well, just to end on, I think there are five that I think are, are critically important. And we've got to develop, we haven't got at the moment, we haven't got to develop a language that's appropriate for the 21st century through which we can, we can communicate these ideas and win over the idealism of young people. I think the key challenge for us is to appeal to the idealism which young people still have, despite the way they're socialized, through virtues that will give them the strength, the inner strength and the confidence to engage with the world outside there. I think the first thing is courage, right? I do think that courage needs to be reinforced. And courage, I don't mean by courage, one of those uh, you know, people going out and shooting people and beating each other up. Courage basically means having the capacity uh, to deal with uncomfortable situations, to deal with pressure, to be able to deal with, the, in particular, the uncertainties in the world that we're faced with. Because we have to live with uncertainties in the, in the 21st century. And we have to be able to stand up and deal with them. I really don't like the fact that in Britain, the advice on terrorism in, on the railways are uh, to go away, you know, sort of to, to look and, and run away. You know, sort of that, basically it's about running away rather than actually maybe tackling them. Mm. You know, maybe unless we learn to tackle terrorists, they will be encouraged to terrorize us. I mean, the best way of discouraging terrorism is when they know we, that we refuse to be terrorized. That's the only answer as far as I'm concerned. The second one is loyalty. Loyalty has become a, a, a bad word. In England, the, the most celebrated individual uh, uh, individuals are called whistleblowers. Now, whistleblower used to be an honorable occupation when it was very difficult, when you went against the grain, when you had to struggle to make yourself heard. Today, people whistleblow routinely. If they don't like something, they will kind of complain. It's like little children complaining to mommy, mommy, look what Mary has done. You know, that, it's that kind of attitude which is now institutionalized and rewarded and celebrated. So loyalty, I think, is really quite important. Duty, I really think duty is at the moment a lost cause that we got to actually take seriously. We don't want to lose that because unless people have a sense of duty, we cannot take responsibility uh, for the younger generations. We have duties to ourselves, but very importantly, we have duty to our community. As a society, solidarity is foundational uh, in a sense, to be able to kind of move forward. And instead of seeing duty as a drag, as this horrible burden that we want to dispose of, it is something that we've got, got to have a more creative relationship with. The fourth one is moral autonomy and responsibility. As an old-fashioned liberal at the moment, what I think is crucially important is to, is to develop our sense of conscience, to think in accordance with our, with our moral imagination, so that the actions that we take are grounded in a kind of morally reflected standpoint, and then being prepared to live with the consequences of our action. I think that's crucial. That's where moral autonomy and responsibility come in. Okay, I might make a mistake, I might have made the wrong choice, but I, as an adult, I'm prepared to live with the consequences of my mistakes. I think that, that is very, very important, and particularly important for young people to learn. And finally, something that I'm sure you've been discussing here a lot, it's freedom. Right? Now, when I went to university, and when I look back upon my life, freedom was something everybody, everybody believed in, at least rhetorically. Freedom was something that we wanted to expand. The idea of there being too much freedom if you're Hungarian in 1956 was weird. Right? It, you couldn't have too much freedom. Similarly, when you went to the West, freedom was something that people struggled for and gave their lives to, to achieve. Today, on campuses, people spend more time trying to limit freedom, to constrain the freedom to express yourself. People spend more time trying to limit the freedom of religion and the freedom of conscience than they did in the 18th century, when all in intelligent and interesting people were devoted to expanding the domain of religious freedom and the freedom of conscience. 
So it seems to me that we have to win the battle for freedom, which in many parts of the Western world is regarded as not an important thing. It's no big deal, is what one of my American students once said when I discussed free speech. And when I heard the expression, it's no big deal, I realized that it was time I wrote a book. Thank you. Frank will stand at the lectern to take questions. I think that was a terrific speech and uh, full of, um, there's a lot of questions I'm sure in the audience. Um, I have some, if, um, but maybe I can throw open the floor right away and ask, yes. Well, well thank you very much indeed for that fascinating and uh, rather worrying presentation. Um, um, I, I, was, I, was, I was struck by some of the comments you made towards the beginning about the uh, embarrassment and self-loathing of Western elites in relation to culture and history. And uh, the, the parallels between that assessment and Douglas Murray's recent uh, uh, work on the strange death of Europe. And, uh, and could I ask uh, what your take is on the, on the, on the, on the Murray thesis, essentially, that, that what, what, you, what you were saying there about the lack of uh, self-confidence combined with the assertiveness, assertiveness of certain minorities um, you know, could, could uh, you know, critically threaten the very existence of Western civilization. I suppose I, I take a slightly different slant in that, for me, the, the problem is never the minorities. It, it's never the people that have kind of come into the country. It's got to do with the fact that when people come into England, Nobody expects them to be English. You know, I'm, I remember I was talking to this Polish friend of mine who, who came to England, and he said, it's really interesting. I come to, to England to learn English and to be an English person. And the minute I arrive, I'm given help um, where people say, don't worry about it. We have Polish translators. Mm -hmm. And don't worry about it. You know, we have all these people who speak Polish who will help you to get welfare and benefits and everything else. And what we're doing there is instead of turning these people into people like us, we're telling them that your way of life is as good as ours and just get on with it. And so what we created in Europe is we created, because of the, uh, because of the reluctance of uh, Western elites in Europe to, to actually value assimilation and believe in the idea of assimilation, what we've done is we created a parallel world. Uh, I mean, when you go to Northern England, when you go to places like Bradford and Leeds, Oldham, you know, it is like going into three different, I was in Paris recently, and I went to the Mont, you know, Montparnasse, Mont 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 those areas. I went walking around the Gare du Nord, and I felt that I was going in from one country to another all the time. And I think that, you know, people say, well, that's migrants, and of course, it's not that I'm necessarily a fan of migration, but I think the real, you know, to me the guilt and the problem lies with those individuals who basically said, you know, we're not going to hold our culture to account. We're not going to you know, create, a, create a world where we're, you know, we're developing a French society. Instead of saying that, people said, well, you know, who knows what's going to happen? Let's just see. And I think that's been very corrosive and dangerous because when I talk to my, for example, I, I have a lot of Muslim students in the university. When I talk to them, they actually tell me that, you know, I, they don't understand you know, why British society goes on and on and on about radical Islam. He says, well, because they say, at least radical Islam gives us something. We don't get anything from England. And basically, when you talk to them, they actually feel morally superior to English people. They think that English people you know, are not leading a moral life, and they're right. Actually, they happen to be right on that point. They basically are right to say that, uh, you know, that a lot of people in, in, in England have lost all that, whereas, whereas they have a morality, which I don't agree with, I, I dislike. But at least they've got that. And I think the responsibility for that is always with the host society. It's always with, with the establishment of those societies who've just given up on leading, who've just given up their duty and responsibility. And, and what we've seen in Europe is the loss of that less free the core, the idea of noblesse, noblesse oblige, all these things that were really quite important are just gone. Thank you, Professor, for the presentation. Um, I have a little, little problem with the progressive education because, in my opinion, 
um, all the blame, or most of the blame for today's problem, socialization, is being put on the, this progressive education after the First World War. And um, certainly there is some truth. I mean, we all see in extremes, you know, when, 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 you, have, uh, when you see academic work, for example, you, you can see the extreme you were talking about. But what about the role of um, consumeristic society in bringing up children, in um, creating this uh, lack of social skills? You talk about parenting skills, but there's also, I often hear, social skills. This individualism, this consumerism that makes people individuals and consumers, it has taken away a bit of uh, skills that we learned for, you said, 200 years, but we can say more than that. Um, for instance, Many years ago, very few people had formal education. And yet, there was no problem with authority, there was no problem with everybody knowing his place in, in society. So, perhaps that's something else that we have to look at. And one thing about validation, um, yes, that, 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 that is a problem. Nobody wants to be criticized anymore. But my observation, uh, working with uh, people from you know, different backgrounds, different countries, what I noticed that what we have, all generations, or in uh, Western Europe, in, in Central Europe, or Southern Europe, compared to the Anglo-Saxon education, is a lack of confidence after the school. Um, I, I worked with very in many intelligent people from Eastern Europe, from Poland, from Hungary, and they had no confidence at all, because they were criticized all the time. They were put down. They were told, you know, you're an idiot if you didn't prepare your lesson. And on the contrary, you can see kids from, from the US, from the UK, from Australia, just sailing through the work careers, 35 years old, great responsibility. And um, could it be down to validation as well? Don? Well, uh, I, think the, I think you got a point in, in, in everything you've said. I think the, the confident Western kids you see are of a certain type. You know, the, if you go to America and Canada and England, I will introduce you to a vast majority of, of people who aren't like that. There are self-selecting people that would come to Hungary, who, who would travel and all the rest of that. But you do have a point. Uh, but uh, but the, it seems to me, I'm, I'm actually pl a pluralist in my pedagogic orientation. I think that there isn't one way of teaching children. It depends upon the teacher. And I've seen some wonderful so-called progressive educators who are very sensitive and are able to inspire the, you know, the young people in a particular way. And I've seen some horrible you know, sort of teachers that are using traditional pedagogy. So I don't think that it's, it's black and white. And, and I, I've always argued, I wrote a book about this, that pedagogy is going to be open-ended and specific to the circumstances. Um, but it seems to me that um, the kind of confidence you talk about, the kind of, uh, you know, sort of, uh, that, that comes with, uh, being validated um, it, it isn't just simply being validated, it's having money, it's having resources, it's having parenting uh, uh, investment, emotional and other kind of investment within your time. And it's a confidence that, that is actually very shallow. And I can tell you, I mean, my son went to probably the, one of the best schools in England. And all his friends, when, when they finish school, are phenomenally confident. And when you you know, you get intimidated when you talk to these 18 or 19 year olds. You know, roll the film forwards three, four years later, and you'll find that actually that kind of confidence that they gain has kind of worn away. And they're becoming more and more like everybody else because at the end of the day, psychological techniques and instrumental interventions in your internal life do not give you the, the foundation and the strength you need to deal with difficult kind of challenges. So I think that, it, that uh, you know, that there is a problem here. And, and I'm not advocating that the, the alternative to that is to always criticize people, to beat people, to wear them down. I think a proper way of educating young people is a, is a balance where you challenge them, you stretch them. And I think my pedagogy is based upon one principle and one principle alone, which is that whoever you teach, at whatever your level, you raise their expectations. The more you raise their expectations, the better they do. And I think that's the key. It doesn't matter how you do it, what kind of pedagogic <coughs> techniques that you uh, adopt for that, that's what you do. And it seems to me that, the, the, you know, I, I'm not, I wasn't blaming uh, progressive education for the problem. I was just using uh, progressive education as an illustration of a, of a wider trend. 
because progressive education leads to the products of their society. And I think the real problem that we have in our society is not so much consumerism, but the fact that if you destroy the confidence of parents, which is what expertise does, then parents begin to lead, lead, you know, become more and more insecure in their child-rearing techniques. And they begin to lead more and more their, of their lives to their children. I've noticed that in Hungary. That when I, when I watch mothers and fathers play with their children, you know, and there's a lot of children around, they only have eyes for their own child. They don't notice all the other kids that are playing there. And I think that's kind of privatization of child rearing, where you, where you fragment kids from each other, is, is one of the most destructive consequences of this form of, of socializing through validation. The example I always remember, and I, I, I kind of have nightmares about, is watching young people play football. When my son was playing football, the parents are on two sides, and you watch the parents' eyes, and the parents are watching only their child, and when the game is finished, you know, the only thing they care about is whether their child played well. If the team lost, it doesn't matter, as long as little Tommy did good. You know, and if the, and if the, if the team won, but little Tommy wasn't playing, it was taken off, that's like a tragedy. And that kind of privatized way of bringing kids up is, is, is obviously uh, blamed on consumers, but it's got to do with the uh, indirect consequences of, uh, of the misdirection of socialization. Thank you, the lady in the green on the right. Um, but I think the question of the consumer attitude is very, very important. I mean, as a teacher, you learn to be snappy, more and more snappy, even if you teach Latin or German language, which is completely absurd. You become an entertainer, and it has to be, uh, I mean, the teaching has to be like a, t uh, a TV show. So, I mean, this aspect is very important, but where you were talking about, and should not be, uh, yeah, put away. Thank you. In English, we call this um, making education relevant, yeah, right? And, you know, and therefore, basically, you know, a good teacher is not somebody that has got a PhD in, in Latin or classics or in physics. A good teacher is somebody with a good sense of humor, a clown, you know. Worse still, a good teacher is somebody who's friends with the students, you know, the student's friends, you know, sort of. A good teacher is somebody that's got you got whiteboards in Hungary, where you got whiteboards and all this, you know, uh, online gadgets kind of going on all the time. And a, a good teacher, basically, is somebody who's, who, you know, who, who entertains the, the, the child. I think that, that's that's for sure. Um, and that, to me, um, is is what validation is really all about. I mean, what what validation leads to are these techniques, you know, what I call techniques of performance. You know, and the most important performative thing you do when you validate uh, a child or, or young people is, is basically to be like them, to be their friends. To, you know, we have a situation in England where mothers who are 35 or 36 are boasting about the fact that when they go shopping, it's their daughter that tells them what to wear rather than the other way around. And they're very happy about the fact that there's been this reversal in, in wisdom, that it's the child who's smart, and encouraging children to think that they know more than we do is part and parcel of this uh, educational relevance. Frank, uh, you mentioned uh, the head teacher describing themselves as a master learner. And one of the biggest challenges, especially for slightly older people like myself, is that the world is changing at such a rapid pace that we have to keep up with all these changes. So uh, I'm sure you know that the most popular online course in the world at the moment is called Learning How to Learn. Yeah. How do you prepare your students for the future in which everything you teach them may change at some point over their career? Well, uh, I've written a critique of the idea of learning to learn because I think it's a myth. You, you know, you, the idea of learning to learn uh, bypasses the fact that the only way you learn uh, and, and well, the only way you get educated is by studying a specific kind of discipline. And it seems to me that the attempt to create what are called generic skills, which is what learning to learn does, that somehow you, you can learn to learn by adopting certain techniques, um, 
overlooks the fact that, okay, you can learn certain tricks here and there, but at the end of the day, most people who are become, become creative, independent thinkers do so, do so by struggling with a certain kind of academic discipline. And I think that's what the learning to learn school, which is what the PISA people also promote, uh, overlooks. You use the expression, you know, that we live in a rapidly changing world. And I think if you take a step back, rapidly changing world, and ask ourselves the question, is our world really changing that much more rapidly than around 1900? Because I can tell you, if you talk to a Hungarian, an average Hungarian person, at the end of 1918, they would talk about a world that they have lost, that they had, their world has become changed fundamentally. And, I, and I've done a study of this, and I go back, and I can give you recitations uh, from uh, different historical periods, ever since the Roman Empire, where the complaint goes up that the world is changing so much that we don't recognize it anymore. It's, it's, so, it's so rapidly changing, right, that we need a new language. To, and this is like the, the human condition. I mean, thankfully, the world is changing because we're changing, we're interacting with the world. But we today have this arrogant uh, assumption that no other generation of people in human history have ever experienced the kind of changes that we, we kind of gone through. Just imagine, you know, you're a peasant, a, you know, a farmer in the middle of the Industrial Revolution in England. And you blink your eyes, and the landlord has just thrown off of the land. And now you have got, you, you, your family has been torn apart, and you're now working in a mill in Manchester in conditions that you never imagined existed. And you live in this environment that is totally, fundamentally different than the one that you grew up in. And your child, you know, who has now grown up in Manchester and Liverpool in this industrial environment, has got to make their, make their way in a world where the old family system no longer exists, right, where, the, where the old extended family has broken down. And now you've got maybe a mother, if you're lucky, sometimes just one parent. So I, I would say that there's a kind of uh, anachronism about the, the view that we lived in this uh, rapidly changing world, which legitimates all the, you know, all the kind of practices, educational and child-rearing practices, that basically legitimate the failure to socialize, and, more, and I didn't get a chance to talk about this, ultimately the failure to educate. Because I think education is, is something that's a different subject, but does involve developing a relationship with the past and with the knowledge of the past that we're gradually forgetting about. I mean, history is becoming an alien subject now in many European countries. Thank you, Lee Cohen. I'm a visiting fellow here with the Danube Institute. At first, I was bitter at what you had to say, the blame you put on the United States, and then I was appalled to think that Europe has taken all this on board, uh, that we've exported it, because certainly at home, our education system has been infected by the disease of political correctness to the extent that we erase history, we change history to, in an attempt to preserve the feelings, to not hurt feelings of certain groups, etc. cetera. And um, therefore, I found your list of five very interesting, but I would add one, and that, that's truth, and that we have a responsibility to teach the truth rather than to try to preserve feelings. And I'd like your response to that, please. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. <clears throat> About 15 years ago, I wrote a book called Where Have All the Intellectuals Gone? <clears throat> and one of the chapters is called The Truth. And when somebody reviewed the book, either in The Guardian or in The Times, they, they said, ho, 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 Frank Ferreira still believes in the truth. <laughs> and, and, and they thought that I was this kind of, you know, sort of slightly idiotic light-headed individual for still believing <coughs> that there is such thing as the truth. As it happens, I think what's important is not the truth, um, but the quest for the truth. I think the fantastic thing about the quest for the truth is you're probably never going to capture the truth completely, but the more you struggle intellectually and morally to gain those kinds of insights, the, the more you'll benefit and the more society benefits, because truth is one of those things that we can 
On a good day, glimmer and into it. But on a bad day, we almost become you know, too scared to confront. In my life, I always remember that. I remember those days when, you know, like in a cartoon, you got the light bulb shining, you know, sort of. And suddenly you see, you know, suddenly the truth presents itself to you. And I think that's really brilliant. And just when you touch it like that, like a bar of soap, it goes out in your hand. And it tells you that you've got to struggle, you lead your whole life in that kind of, essentially a kind of quest. Which is why in the Bible, the, my favorite bit of the Bible is the book of Job. I think that, that's from a philosophical point of view. It's such an interesting uh, section of the, of the Bible that raises so many of the issues uh, that we're confronted with today. There's a, a, a philosopher called Kierkegaard, you know, sort of that deals with this, uh, I think, in a very, very uh, sens sensitive way. In fact, I, I started giving fear and trembling by Kierkegaard to my students all the time. Go away and read it, see what you think. But, but I'm sorry, could you just respond to sparing feelings versus... Absolutely, I think you're, you know, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think that sparing the feelings leads to dishonesty. And, and, and we kind of institutionalize dishonesty in all kinds of ways by saying there's no one answer that that's the truth. We basically, when we hear people say things that are completely idiotic, we look, hmm, interesting. We, instead of saying, you being an idiot, you know, which is, you know, what you should be saying under those circumstances. So we are circling around and avoiding that creative engagement with the truth. And, and, and it does lead to institutional um, dishonesty and the encouragement of, of, of young people not to take themselves seriously. I mean, that's the biggest problem. Um, thank you for a great presentation uh, coming from the uh, environment that you have been discussing. Uh, it certainly feels something that I can resonate with. Uh, I've got, well, um, a question that has two parts. Uh, first of all, uh, you started with an example uh, of your um, first year students and you asking them whether they feel uh, as children or as uh, young adults. How do you think the disappearance of, uh, of well, conscription and military duty before the before university affected that and affected uh, the sort of feeling of being responsible within these people. Uh, and the second question is, how do you think uh, the role of educators has changed uh, in the past 20 or 30 so years? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, I, I think it's more fundamental than just simply military conscription. It's basically not expecting children to contribute to society. So the story I always tell is that <clears throat> when I was uh, nine, I used to have a newspaper around. I used to go around from, 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 from house to house delivering newspapers. That was why we were making money at the age of nine. And I had, you know, I, I had my pocket money that I got through my little job before school. Now when my son went to the newsagent in my town because they were advertising for somebody to help deliver a newspaper. When he went there, I think he was 12 at the time, so he goes up to the guy and says, look, I'm here to work for you. I'm your, I'm, your, I'm your solution to the problem. The guy says, how old are you? He says, I'm 12. He says, well, I'm, I'm sorry. In this country, you've got to be at least 14 and a half, 15 before you can do it. And just imagine the impact that it had on him. Right? That somehow, as a 12-year-old, he wasn't taken sufficiently seriously to be capable of delivering newspapers. And I think it's that lowering of expectations of which um, taking responsibility for your country by fighting for your country is also a part of. So it's a wider thing that, than that. I have come to the conclusion as it happens that many societies in Europe could do with the reintroduction of national service. <clears throat> I think that could be a really good thing. You know, when I was in Israel, I was struck by the fact that young people in Israel get their uh, friendship and their education and their motivation from their army. They, it's the most character-forming experience that they have. And when you talk to them, you'll find that even 20 years later, all their best friends were from the army. And, and I think the most important that, that they learn from being in the army is that the, the responsibility for the future of the country doesn't just simply rely on politicians, but they have to play a role in, in relation to that. And I think uh, teaching that responsibility is, is really quite crucial. Uh, I, get, I get horrified when I hear people proudly declare in England, 
I would never fight for my country. You know, and they think that's really cool. Or I would never fight for my country. You know, sort of, no wonder that you have so many terrorists that having a big smile on their face when you have people who are not even prepared to lift a finger to protect themselves. Uh, change subject. Um, I would like to see your opinion about the effect of digitalization and mobile telephones and whatever on the behavior and mental uh, development of our children. Right, but you're not going to like my answer. I can tell you that. I, I've, I've been involved in a lot of debates on that. I, I did a research project for uh, a couple of uh, telephone companies, uh, Orange and another one, on what's called digital childhood. And when we carried the research, we basically take, came to the conclusion that uh, blaming digital technology for the problems with childhood is a, is a kind of Freudian displacement activity. And we somehow find it much easier to blame all oh, these children are up all night on the, social, you know, on the social media, or look what it does to their brain. And uh, you know, we found, and I think there's a lot of research that shows, that children who are very good offline, who are very educated, are the best in the class, are also the most competent online. Right? There is no contradiction between having a rich online experience and having a rich offline experience. The two go hand, the two go hand in hand. And there's been this new field of neuroscience that claims that children's brains are changing. You know, sort of that their attention span is being destroyed. Where I argue that if there's a problem with attention span, it's because we're not holding their attention. It's because the quality of our ideas are so poor and so uninspirational that it's not really working. And I, I've written a book <coughs> on this called The Power of Reading. And one of the points I make in the book is that ever since the Greeks, technology has been blamed for educational issues. So you have Socrates saying that reading is a danger because it will mean that people will start forgetting things. In the Roman Empire, Cicero argued, oh my God, there are so many books around. This is like a time when there's barely like two, 3,000 scrolls all over Rome. People have too much choice in what they're reading and they're going to forget, they're going to have attention problem. So as you go down through all the generations, you will find that the same points that are being made about how our brains are changing was actually already argued in the 18th century when women were absorbed in reading novels for the first time and in the 19th century. So I think that technology, digital technology, has its good sides, its bad sides. You've got to control young people's behavior online in the way you got it offline, but it's not the problem. It's merely a convenient way of explaining away all of our societal faults. Um, another question? <coughs> Thank you for your presentation. I was wondering, as uh, education more or less uh, lacks discipline, the first uh, encounter of the university students is uh, with discipline is the labor market. Uh, what do you think of this? Uh, that uh, firms might be just frustrated to have these boys and girls, and could it mean a labor productivity shock also for the economy? Yeah, I've been debating this at home for a long time, even within my family, because we, we all know that discipline in English has, is now a dirty word. When you, people no longer use, use the word discipline, you know, they, they have other ways of expressing, you know, basically we should be negotiating with each other, you know, we should find different ways of yeah, kind of holding the lines. And we started, so my, my wife used to argue uh, that, you know, Frank, what you've got to realize is that, okay, they're being validated now, but when they go to, the, to work and discipline hits them in the head, as you say, they will have to rise to the occasion. Well, do they have to do that? Because I think what's happening, if you look at human resources uh, 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 advocates in, in England, they're all saying we have to change the workplace to make it possible for millennials to work, you know, to, to kind of be able to, you know, sort of, take themselves seriously. So we have now flexible arrangements about what time you arrive at work. You have, you know, I mean, Google is the best example. I don't know if you ever, ever if you're anybody that works for Google. You go to Google and it looks like a playpen. There are fruits on the table. <clears throat> there are, so if, you go in, if you go into their place in Dublin, 
There are nice soft toys you can cuddle. You know, sort of, you have sort of me time. You know, have you heard of me time? You know, where you basically can switch off, you know, sort of, and, and, and be yourself and reflect. You have wellness classes. You have mindfulness, you know, sort of weeks away. I mean, every single, you know, sort of junk therapy that uh, a Western civilization has come up with is introduced there. So we're finding a, a huge problem, which is reflected in a very high turnover of young professionals. I mean, the, the rate at which they leave their jobs is one of the biggest concerns in industry. And it does have consequences for productivity. Basically, it means that if you're running a company in England, and you have a choice between an English millennial and a Polish student who has been spared of this kind of education, you go for the Pole, or you go for the Chinese, or you go for the Asian, because they will get up on time. And they don't think it's too much to ask that on some days you stay over an extra hour. Sometimes you work nine hours. My God, nine hours. How could you do that? The world will come to an end. They will do it. But in, in, in the Western context, particularly the Anglo-American context, that is seen as a crime for an employer to ask you to stay behind for a couple of hours. And even, this is even now beginning to happen in the financial world. The financial world, banking was the last domain that you know, high pressure, it's still high pressure, no doubt about it, but they're, still, they're already beginning to make allowances for this new breed of students who find it very difficult uh, having to work on the weekend. I'm bound to say, when you listed all the things that, that Google employees went through, it struck me that a writer living alone writing an article would come across each one of those in a single afternoon. Um, <laughs> uh, um, are there any more questions? Um, yes, the lady, um, uh, Janet. Thank you. My question is simply, and I'm pretty well aware of just about everything you've said, is where do we go from here? Because I have found a tent and I'm hiding and I'm miserable and depressed because I don't see any way to rectify these situations and problems. Well, I, just, just two things. I mean, the reason why I'm interested in discussing this in Hungary is because Hungary is still not totally affected by this. I, I mean, the Hungarian Budapest middle class has been educated in this to some extent, but not to the same extent. I mean, even my Hungarian Budapest middle class friends who basically devoted their lives to their child and you know, where they kind of give them private tutoring and they take them to ballet and take them to music lessons, take them to sports and just kind of hover over them all the time and deny their child independence. Even those Hungarian parents are pretty robust compared to their English equivalents uh, or to their American equivalents. So, I think that Hungary still got a chance to basically ask a few questions and to stand back. And that's why I'm interested in the, raising these kind of questions here. Um, but you raise a very interesting point, and I think it's possible just to give up. I feel like that sometimes and say, well, maybe, you know, I was born in the wrong place at the wrong time, you know, sort of, but that's not going to work. Um, and therefore, I draw the conclusion that the, the key way forward is to try to find a way of, of uh, of coming together as, as, as parents, but for example, organizing ourselves in such a way that we challenge this thing. We, I, I know groups of parents that call themselves, I know a group, a, a group of parents in New York that call themselves subversive parents, and they do stuff like let their kids walk to school on their own, they do stuff like uh, you know, basically educate their children to challenge all the psychological therapeutic stuff they get in school. Um, and, and they try to find, you know, I've got a friend in, in, in London who's basically organized a group of parents who allow their kids to walk. To, I know it doesn't sound big thing, but I their children. My grandchildren are in this situation in Toronto, but, where they're not allowed to walk one block. Yeah, well, but these children walk, you know, and the parents are basically, and, and they get criticized. I mean, they get very heavy criticism. You're so irresponsible. How can you allow your kids to walk? So you can do these things, but most importantly, I mean, this is what I'm devoting my, the rest of my days, I've got a few years left, hopefully, is, uh, is basically to discuss with a particular group of people. These are young kids between the age of 16 to 19. I think they're the most important group because they're smart, they are open-minded still. Despite their education, they're still idealistic. 
Um, they're there to be challenged and inspired. And it seems to me that if we can appeal to their active side rather than appeal to their neg negative passive side, then we can begin to educate and, 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 and socialize them in ways that they will grow up to be really smart kids. And I haven't given up. In London, I, uh, a, a group of us have organized a freedom school uh, in March. We had 250 16 to 19 year olds come, and they were like dynamite. I mean, they really were, you know, I mean, they all coming in there, they took themselves seriously. They, they read everything, which is very rare these days, and, and they were debating and arguing, and, you know, and, and it really reminds me that this is not a hopeless fight. I just think we, that we need to raise the stakes. We need to make people aware of the dangers that this represents, because usually what happens is that we only see one symptom of a problem. You know, poor, you know, the way that parents get paranoid, that's one symptom. We see another symptom, the way that schools just roll over and basically treat children childishly. We see another symptom where we refuse to teach kids history. So we just see this, but when you bring them all together and explain the, the logic and the coherence and the unity behind them, then I think we can uh, create a, an intellectual backlash, what I call a countercultural movement that can begin to raise the issues and hopefully win the fight. Um, before we close, in a minute, I just want to ask two more questions. One is directly related to the discussion of today, and it's, it's a very simple one, which is, um, how is it that the children who emerge from this easygoing uh, parenting on the one hand, and the schools that lack authority or teach child-centered education on the other, how is it that the people who emerge from this process arrive at university as red guards who want to impose an often very rigid um, set of well illiberal ideas on on the teachers and on the rest of the and on the university. Well, I don't think they think of themselves as being red guards. Uh, they think of themselves as being aware. That's the that's the word they use. We are aware, you're not, and because we're aware, it, it, and it's almost got a, a quasi-religious connotation. We are entitled to tell you how to become aware yourself. But I think the problem, and this is something that uh, does need to be explored and taken seriously, is when you arrive at the university. I, mean, I, I remember when I was a university, I, I was a student radical in the 1960s. I used to organize strikes and go on demonstrations. But when I used to organize strikes and go on demonstrations, I met resistance. You know, people would push back. Sometimes the police would acquaint me with their batons. Right? And there was a certain kind of discipline that was imposed upon me, and you knew what was going on. These days when you arrive on campus, it's almost as if you're encouraged to behave in the way you described, by the authorities. The doors are open, they don't need to be kicked through. And the minute you enter the university, you will find there are people there that are cultivating this kind of uh, arrogant sensibility. They are encouraging you to behave in this particular kind of way. So in many respects, it's not the students that have somehow miraculously become these arrogant people that are, that are kind of tearing things down. It's, it's that it's the authorities and others who are encouraging them to behave in this kind of a way. <coughs> and you saw this in the Rose Moss Fall campaign in Oxford, where students going to Oxford you know, are now getting classes in, in how to become enlightened, how to not be racist, how to consent. They're getting re-socialized the very first week that they're there. And after this socialization program, this social engineering program, it is not, not surprising that they will act in accordance to the role that's been assigned to them. It's amazing grace, isn't it? <coughs> amazing grace, uh, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was blind, but now I see and so on, and now I'm going to make you see as well. Um, the, that second question arose from a discussion that, uh, before you came today. Um, we had originally discussed the possibility that you might discuss the whole question of conscientious objection, and I raised that simply because following the uh, um, abortion referendum in Ireland, and I think you and I take different sides on this, a new um, uh, element in the debate has, is emerging in the form of a discussion of conscientious objection to, for doctors and nurses. And, and I wonder, I know you have uh, strong views on this. Yes, I mean, I, I'm really disturbed the way in which uh, your conscience 
and the ability to act in accordance with your conscience, particularly if you're religious, is being uh, criminalized in many parts of Europe. And the way in which, for example, people argue that if you are uh, a doctor, you, you know, you have to carry out an abortion even if it's against your conscience. Even, you know, even though in the past it was recognized that you, know, you as a doctor should be able to feel at ease with what, you, what you're doing. And I think one of the things that I find you know, really, really uh, worrisome is that very often a religion, you know, anti-religious sentiments are used, not necessarily because people care that much about religion, but as a way of changing the way that we organize our life and we think about the world. And in particular, what I find is <laughs> the new argument that's used, which basically says that parents educating children in their religion are somehow doing something wrong. Uh, some people, some, uh, some liberals, well, well, people that call themselves liberals these days, not what I call liberal, like Richard Dawkins, actually calls people who teach their children to be Catholics to commit a form of child abuse. And the reason why it's child abuse is because the children didn't have a chance to work out for themselves, you know, to be Catholic. I was involved in a debate two months ago against some Scandinavian politicians who argued that Jewish people should no longer be able to circumcise their boys uh, because the children did not consent. And therefore, children's rights was put, in a sense, in direct opposition to religious practices that existed for two, three, I mean, well, since the beginning of Judaism, in a, in a sense. And increasingly, what we're finding is that practices that, that are taken for granted in, in most of our European religions are being challenged on, on the grounds that they go against the grain of an enlightened society. And I think the question of conscience is key because you have to remember that liberalism and the very idea of tolerance and freedom was initiated in Amsterdam first by Spinoza and by John Locke in England when they basically argued that people have got the right to believe what they want to believe in. They need not, and not, not simply uh, follow the state religion or whatever anybody wanted. And basically, John Locke and people like him were arguing for the right of conscience to be recognized both legally and conventionally. And today, we do the opposite. You know, we, we begin by questioning freedom of speech, and finally we get to the point where your, your ability to act in accordance with your conscience, with your internal soul, becomes an area of contestation and debate. And I think that's going to be a battleground that's going to become increasingly more and more important in Europe in the next few years. Frank, uh, thank you very much indeed for today's discussion, debate and speech. It's been extremely enlightening. It's thrown up, as we knew it would, uh, n a number of fascinating uh, questions, some of which we didn't have time to deal with. For example, I think towards the end when we were discussing um, the idea of people being woke or awake, um, the, 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 the ideas of, of um, the recent, uh, the, um, sorry, the late Kenneth Minogue, the philosopher in the pure theory of uh, ideology, they come into this, and I think we might return at some point to discuss the wider application of that analysis because it is very important. We're living in a more ideological age, and the differences between the ideology shouldn't um, blind us to the fact that, in a sense, there's an underlying uh, ideology happening, which is cha which people need to be aware of, and in order to be able to counteract, um, in other words, the idea of consciousness raising uh, ought to be applied to consciousness raising, which is because it's not always a, 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 a genuine independent decision. So I'd like to say that it was absolutely a fascinating uh, uh, event. Thanks for coming. Uh, come back, and we look forward to carrying on the discussion over drinks and coffee. Thank you. Thank you.